the audio now. Can anyone hear me yet? Uh, looks like okay. Well, if you can see and hear me, then um, let's just let's just chat a little bit, and I'll just monitor the chat here. And uh, you know, if you have any nice, simple questions that you can ask me by chat that I can answer that don't require me to, you know, do screen shares and fancy stuff like that. Let's just talk a little bit. So, you know, questions normally about music for the music masterclass as opposed to about music or, but whatever. If it's something I can answer easily, I'll do my best. And um, we'll do this for a little bit and then, uh, and then call it a day. So anything I can help anyone with here. So as you may know, I'm broadcasting from the airport, and that's why I have no, uh, and the internet connection here is quite spotty. Usually it's very good. I don't know what was happening, but security line was really long, so I didn't get to test. Um, I just set up and go, and uh, um, unfortunately, uh, internet connection is not happy where I'm at. So if you got a question that you, you can um, uh uh, ask, go ahead. So a couple of questions here. Um, okay. So Nicholas is asking, do I sing to myself? And the, <laughs> the answer is yes. And, um, you know, I'm not too embarrassed to uh, sing a little bit here, but I'll tell you something that, um, uh, yeah, definitely questions about your training. And this is actually going to relate to that. I find myself for the last several months, uh, singing, um, singing a particular song. And I'm going to try to sing that and then talk through it a little bit. And I, I, I think I did this once before, in a, either in a math class or maybe it was during, I think it was actually during an office hours. Uh, before I do that, Dave's got a nice quick question. Are there workspaces in MuseCore 4? Yes, absolutely. So first of all, you can certainly add fretboard diagrams to your main workspace. It's just called default. But if you feel like having separate workspaces for separate purposes, the controls are at the bottom along with concert pitch and, and the Zoom controls and so forth. So you'll see a place where it says workspace default. And if you uh, press that button there, you can uh, create new workspaces and customize the palettes exactly as you did in MuseCore 3. So the only difference is where the command, where the control is, bottom of the screen instead of the top. So I'm going to try to sing you a little bit of this song. Um, and uh, let's... Uh, and I'm going to sing it and then talk about That's the piece. I'm going to sing that again in a second, but I'm going to ask, answer Dave's question first. Yeah, no, MuseCore 4 has fretboards by default. I thought you wanted to customize them. You just have to add the guitar palette. So at the top of the palettes panel, if you think about in MuseCore 3, there was a basic workspace and an advanced workspace. And you probably switched to the advanced long ago and forgot about it. In MuseScore 4, you, there is not an advanced workspace to switch to. You just add the palettes you want. So at the top of the palettes, palettes panel, you'll see an Add Palettes button. Click that, and you can add the guitar palette and whatever others you want. So let me sing my piece again. It's, it's always a little bit different, but it's similar. <laughs> So that is my melody. I'll let that rest while I answer a couple little questions and then I'll come back to it. Katrina, you're asking about the, good, the discussion and support space. If you've registered for the Mastering Muse Score course, you should have access. If not, send me a message, and I will try to fix that. Usually, it happens automatically. But of the several hundred people that have registered for the course, like maybe half a dozen, the automation didn't work correctly. So um, uh, if it didn't add you to that space automatically, I can do it. If you're not registered for the course, well, that's what you need to do. Um, so also, I'm going to have answer John's question about um, 
alternate tuning for tablature. Yes, in the instruments panel, uh, in the left sidebar, there's an instruments panel. And in that panel, if you click, if you open up the instrument to show its staves, to show the tablature staff, and then click the gear icon, you can select different things there. Also, I think actually the tuning to get to that, let me take that back. I think you right click the staff and go to staff part properties. That's actually exactly the same as MuseScore 3. Right click the staff, staff part properties, and then you'll see a button to uh, do the uh, tuning. So my question here for you, um, so Katrina, then that's your issue. You need to uh, uh, go to the first lesson in the course the very first lesson of the course has a uh, upgrade coupon that lets you upgrade to the course or up upgrade to the MuseScore 4 uh, course for, you know, basically the same, same total cost as the, right, as the, co as the course would have been on its own. I'm going to sing my melody again. Joanne's asking about the key. I don't know the key. And I guarantee I always do it in the same key. Often, but someone's perfect pitch. Ariana, you got perfect pitch. Uh, let me know. There's the tonic. So I don't have perfect pitch, but I'm going to tell you what I'm going to think while someone gives me the answer. What is that note? It's somewhere a little lower than a G, I feel like. Because G is a note I should build a C comfortably, and that is a little low. I want to say that I'm somewhere a little around F sharp to F. So, um, yeah, so if you're saying F, then that makes total sense. Um, I don't know that that's usually the key. Um, I think if I whistle it, if I whistle it in a different key, and so during the day, I might sing it in a slightly uh, different key as well. My voice is lower in the morning. I want someone to tell me a little bit about this melody. I'm not going to keep singing over and over, but I'm going to sing a little bit. Um, because, you know, people are just talking on their phones around me and they don't care if I sing. Um, 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 da -da, um, is the beginning. Um, is my tonic. Ooh, bum, bum, bum. So I sing scale degrees. I don't love solfege. So, um, Solfege is okay, it has purpose, but I would say scale degrees, especially in minor keys. In minor keys, um, there's a, there's a, some people sing the tonic in the minor key as do. Some people call it la. It, it totally works either way. Um, so, um, yeah, it's somewhere in there, and my voice is wandering all over the place. But if this is my tonic, I don't want to have to think about whether it's do, re, me. Or la, ki, do. I have to think too hard. I can think, I can do numbers easy. It's scale degree one, two, and then the flatted three. Bum is the five, one, five, one, two, flatted three, five. I am outlining the one chord. Ooh, da, da, ooh. Bum, back to the one, ooh, da. five to the flat six. But um, say it's down to four. So if I'm in F, I'm going to try to sing note names then. Why not? F, D, A flat. Oh, by the way, a nice little trick that um, we, we used in a oral skills class that I taught is to sing German pitch names. German pitch names allow you to sing flats in a single syllable and sharps in a single syllable. Um, is my tonic. So I'm going to sing F, G, Os. Os is A flat. And then down to C, F, C, Death. Death is D flat. Death is B flat. Um, I don't know what that note is. I'm going to have to think about this for a second. Do, 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 do. C, des, B, des, um, is back up to us, C, S. So I want to think about what I'm doing harmonically. What I'm doing harmonically here, and this is how I'm going to figure it out without perfect pitch, 
this is a circle of fifths chord progression, whether you can figure it out or not by hearing it. In my head, I'm hearing the circle of fifths. I'm hearing, ooh da dum, bomb is the tonic. Ooh ba do dum, bomb is the tonic. Ba do dum, bomb is the pot is the is the root. Ah, ba dum, bomb is the root. My roots went F D flat. E flat, A flat, and then it's gonna go D flat. So it's gonna go around the circle fifths. So um, that little melody that I sing is a circle of fifths melody, and it's based on the thirds of the chords. Boo-doo-dum is A flat. F. And that's the third of the chord. ba dum is a D flat, and D flat is the root. So D flat is the root. Um, Ba-do-dum, G, and E flat is the root. G is the third. Bum, ba do bum, C, and A flat is the root. It's a melody that goes around the circle of fifths and focuses on thirds of the chords. So, and it starts on a minor chord, goes around the circle of fifths. And if it sounds at all familiar, it's because this is a basic description of a million different melodies. In particular, Fly Me to the Moon. Fly. Uh, uh, fly me to the moon. D flat. Let me play G. D e flat. Among the stars. C. A flat. It's, it's basically Fly Me to the Moon with different melody targeted around the downbeats. So the downbeats of each measure is Fly Me to the Moon, but it's a different melody around it. So that's basically what's going on. So anyhow, this is something that you know, took me a little while to figure that out because I kept hearing it in my head and then you know, tried to figure it out without a piano and kind of did. I still never actually tried to really play it. So, um, uh, so I'm gonna come back and answer a couple of the other questions that flew by here you know, in, in a couple of places. So Ariana, you had a question about um, uh, a specific piece. And of course, I'm not gonna be able to open up your piece right now to, uh, to talk about that but I can talk about things a little more generally. You talked about um, uh, writing for instruments you don't play. And you know, that is a hard thing. I mean, you can, I can write for instruments I don't play, but I wanna understand the, the instrument at least. You know, I wanna understand what's involved in playing. You know, to write for violin, you wanna understand that there's a bow, right? And that you're activating this bow and whether or not you know exactly how to do it. I mean, I even know what the strings are and I can figure out where to put my fingers to play each of the notes. And so if I wanna know, is a particular double stop possible to play? A double stop being two notes at a time? I know, well, let's see, if I wanna play a C and an F at the same time, middle C and the F above it, that middle C I would have to play on the G string and I would play it and I'm gonna think like a guitar player. I would play it at the one, two, three, four, fifth fret, and I'm counting half steps. And then the F would be the D string at the third fret. Well, that feels playable. So, and then I think about, you know, could my fingers do that? And I actually have this device. It's like this piece of paper printed with a fingerboard for violin, viola, cello. I don't remember if there's a bass in there or not. I think maybe not. But, um, and it lets you kind of uh, feel, it lets you put your fingers on the fingerboard in the right places for every note, and then you can tell for yourself what's actually playable. So in any case, knowing those details about how an instrument is played, to me, I want to at least know that much, right? I want to I have some concept of what's involved in playing the instrument. Ideally, I would have a little more than just that. I would have some physical hands-on experience. And I do with most instruments, really strings only barely. But I've, I've played clarinet enough that I can extend that experience to other woodwinds just by knowing their fingerings. I know some of the basic issues. I, I know how to finger notes on a trumpet and I've spent enough time trying to get a sound off the instrument that I have some concept of that. I have less familiarity with trombone, less familiarity with stringed instruments. Guitar, I've spent enough time around guitars to have a sense. So I, I do like to spend time playing with them to help. So anyhow, definitely spend time with the instruments, but, you know, orchestration textbooks and websites and so forth around uh, orchestration will give you some of that as well. 
Uh, all right, so that's kind of a discussion there. Um, I'm gonna kind of just keep scrolling through. And you were also asking about the master class theme. You know, I wrote the, the, the music or cafe theme first, to actually suggested, hey, you should have some theme music. And then I wrote some. And then sometime after that, I'm like, well, gee, I should have music master class theme music also. And I wanted it to be, you know, since I made the cafe kind of, you know, poppy, jazzy master class to be more classical sounding, but not purely classical. I wanted to have a more modern aspect to it. And so that's why the, the cello line is kind of a tango kind of bass line. And so it's got this kind of tango aspect to it rhythmically. And yet it's got this whole counterpoint thing going, because I think I wrote it while I was working on my counterpoint course, maybe. Um, or at least while I was thinking about my counterpoint course. So, um, so yeah, and then the piece just sort of wrote itself from there. Oh, in the beginning, I, I wanted that kind of dramatic beginning that sounds like the beginning of like a Beethoven string quartet or something. So um, uh, that's, that's that answer. Now, Victor's asking about learning to compose music. And let me read your question here. Uh, started to learn to play piano. And yeah, absolutely. Piano is a great instrument. If you want to compose, being able to write things at the piano has a certain immediacy where you can try things out regardless of what instrument you're ultimately writing for. You can try out the melody itself. You can try it out in combination with a harmony part and so forth. So having some basic piano skills is um, really kind of important. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a great skill to have. I'm not saying you have to do it to compose, but it's, it's super useful. So um, there you go. So um, then the question is uh, from Victor about whether it would be worth getting the, my other courses. Um, you know, I'm, obviously I'm going to say yes, but let me talk about my other courses mentioned the the, uh, the counterpoint course. So I'm going to talk about what the three courses that I offer other than the music course. First of all, there's basic music theory. Basic music is as the name stuff that you'd be expected to be about. In other words, you, you should know how to read music. You should know, I mean, before you to actually major in music. You should know how to read music, of course. You should know all your major and minor keys and you should know how to form triads. You should know how to form a C major triad and a C minor triad, et cetera. And you should know your interests and usually they will test you on a part of your audition. And if you don't pass that test, they'll put you in like a remedial theory. And so my basic music theory course is basically that. It's the, the things that you would need to know in order to then major in music in college. So it's, um, it's really useful. It teaches you intervals, it teaches you chords, it teaches you major and minor scales. Then to, but then, you know, that's sort of the raw materials. That's like learning the alphabet, but not actually knowing words, or maybe knowing the alphabet and words, but not knowing how to form sentences, you know? Um, so then the harmony and chord progressions course is where you learn a little more about how these chords fit together to form chord progressions, which is kind of the basis of a lot of music. And then the counterpoint course approaches things from a different angle, looking at how multiple melodic lines work together. And realistically, you could take those two courses in either order. I would think most people would be best off taking the harmony course. A smaller number of people who are like really interested in counterpoint would be interested, would want to take the counterpoint course. And um, uh, the counterpoint course is, I think really good. I mean, there's a lot of counterpoint uh, textbooks and so forth out there, and I have my frustrations with all of them. And I developed my my counterpoint course in part because I thought I could, frankly, do better, <laughs> make it practical. Practical counterpoint is the name of the course. So the counterpoint course is a really good course if you're interested in counterpoint. If you're interested in writing tunes and games that involve, you know, music or cafe. Uh, is kind of canonic. It's got that melody. Line, and then the viola comes into the same line. So there's three different pieces, kind of like a round, but it's not round. The intervals are it. But um, so very specialized and useful if you're interested in that kind of music. But the harmony course is useful for pretty much anyone doing any kind of Western music, whether it's classical music, pop, jazz, pop, 
the uh, the Harmon course is definitely um, is the kind of thing that I would think most people writing music need. But if you're not already comfortable with your, all your spells and words, um, here I saw Ariana, you mentioned about harp, and yeah, harp. I've never really played a harp, but I really got into it when I was in college and really studied it and studied the mechanics of it and how the pedals work as part of the orchestration course. I had an office mate um, when I was teaching there it was a harpist. I taught jazz piano lessons to a girl who was a harpist, and so I, I have some um, connection to the harp. Uh, so that's another instrument, yeah, that I learned a little about. Um, and yeah, I'm glad that the, the this phone thing is working and it's probably it's probably just as well that I'm not on the computer. That just makes things more complicated. Um, Mike Stern practicing in on his in practicing guitar in the airport. That's pretty awesome. Um Todd Linser, wow, that is so cool. So these are big range jazz musicians for people who don't know. Um so uh yeah. Um so yeah, so I would say, Victor, if you are not already comfortable with all your major and minor scales, your intervals, and your chords, basically security chords will get you there, and it will also help solidify music reading. Um, but it's not going to give you exercises to make you good at right reading, sight reading on your instrument. You know, you'll need you'll need to supplement by practicing the instrument. So, um, so how yeah, that's that. Um, so. Uh, yeah, I'll, and I'll tell you, since this also came up in both of these contexts, we talked about courses and we talked about orchestration. I do want to do an orchestration course. And as I've mentioned several times before, you know, I felt with the counterpoint course, I could do a better job. Not because I know more about counterpoint than the people who write counterpoint textbooks, but I think I have a better understanding of where people are coming who want to, who want to study counterpoint outside of a university setting. If you're getting a graduate degree in composition, you study counterpoint because they make you, not because you're interested in it. The people who are interested in counterpoint are usually interested in it for a wide variety of reasons, coming at it from a wide variety of backgrounds, and traditional counterpoint texts don't address that well. And so, I, yeah, I'm not thinking that I know more about counterpoint than the people who write textbooks, but I feel like I understand what they're looking for, and I understood enough about counterpoint to do a good job of it, I think. With orchestration, I, I have left confidence that I understand orchestration well enough because I don't play all those instruments. I haven't written a ton of orchestra music. So I want to produce an orchestration course, but I want it to be a little more elaborate. So I'll collaborate with people who play other instruments and or people who are orchestrators themselves. There's a friend of mine who's a conductor of an orchestra and try to make it in working and so forth. So I, I do a different course, but it's gonna be a it's gonna be a different thing. And so um uh the uh yeah, I'm looking at the chats and things here and uh, just wanna um comment uh, I, I'm I'm losing my train of thought in doing that. So I'm talking about this orchestration course idea. And yeah, it's something I definitely want to do at some point. Because the thing is, there are orchestration textbooks, but for different reasons, you know, I said counterpoint textbooks, I find generally not that useful for people studying counterpoint outside of a university um, degree program. Uh, orchestration uh, textbooks aren't even useful because you can't hear anything, right? I mean, they're textbooks. Orchestration is all about hearing things. If you study counterpoint, you can play examples on the piano and, and learn anything you need. You need to hear virtual orchestra play counterpoint. But counterpoint, the orchestration text, they can tell you things about instruments, but you really want to hear them. So an online course where there's video demonstrations of all the concepts, that's the way to go, right? So, um, so these textbooks are great for the information, but a, an online course is so capable of teaching more by connecting it directly to the sound. And yet textbooks come with a CD and you put the CD in your CD play, queue up track 37, for example, 9B, you know, it's, but, but that's like, hey, I'm reading a lesson. So, um, really, 
something that uh, an online course can really do a good job of. So just by bringing the online aspect to it, I think I can bring something. To it. And there's relatively few other online counterpoint courses. Now, Thomas Goss, if you're familiar with him, G-O-S-S, he's a great teacher of orchestration online, but he doesn't really have a specific course that I know of. If he does, I'm just going to like defer to him and say, yeah, take Thomas's course. I'm not going to improve on Thomas's course. But I don't think he actually really has one. He's got, you know, tips, worksheets and things, but not a just start to finish course. So, um, so that's that. The pieces, the, the orchestration text with Raleigh Strauss. I've never seen Strauss or Tchaikovsky. I haven't seen that. I've got a Rimsky course in Oslo. I've got, um, you know, a few other orchestration text or orchestration textbooks and they're fine for what they are but um but it's not so um or just composing and arranging for band and there's another thing textbooks tend to focus on orchestra but a lot of the information you need is the same information you need to write for a band but then you need to know about saxophones and things and orchestration textbooks will barely touch about that like in an appendix somewhere at best Right? And so there's a lot to learn about orchestration outside the world of books, these books, these books usually cover. Um, so my favorite notation reference books. So first of all, um, the, the kind of the, the industry these days is Elaine Gould's Behind Bars. It's not a cheap book. It's a big book. It's got a lot of information in it. And, you know, People can nitpick details about it and say, well, this doesn't reflect how this publisher did that. She is, or was, she just retired, the chief editor for a major music publisher in the United Kingdom, and probably the biggest music publisher in the United Kingdom, I think, Bobber or Faber, I don't know how you're actually supposed to say it. And um, so she was the chief editor there, and so she's talking about her experience as well as her experience, you know, from having read tons of other scores. She's coming from a huge place of experience in writing this book. On notation practice, um, all the details, you know, exactly how for the population should be and things like that. It's probably overkill for someone just trying to learn about notation. There's any number of cheaper, um, more accessible books to learn about notation and basic practice, but have familiarity with any of them to be able to make recommendations. I will say behind bar, sort of the standard. Now there's other books. There's one by Gardner Reed. There's one by Kurt Stone and um, a couple others that I'm not thinking of. We also have their um, fans that are maybe a little more specialized, not as general as Elaine's is. Um, so uh, I'm not really on a first name basis, but they're Gould. So I'll say Gould when I'm referring to hers. Um, so, uh, so yeah, anyhow, that's a book I recommend. Other than that, I don't have specific recommendations. There's a lot of good stuff out there, but I'm not the one to make the recommendation because I don't have to them. Um, let's see, Ariana's asking about um, transcriptions of, of, of uh, public domain music. Um, so does it matter if you actually get everything right? Well, it's certainly not. I mean, if, if you want to put something if, into a recording and try to transcribe from a recording and put that music up, uh, on uh, on musicore.com, you know, you, you do as well as you want. You make it as accurate as you think you want to. And, you know, you could either make it completely accurate and call it a faithful transcription, or you could say an arrangement based on such and such a recording, right? I mean, there's lots of different uh, room for how you might do that sort of thing. And so it's very, um, uh, it's kind of up to you and your goals, I would say. Um, and anytime you take a piece for orchestra and re re rewrite it for a piece for uh, an ensemble with fewer instruments, something's going to go, right? There's going to be some notes that just don't get covered or don't get covered with the strength they should be. Um, uh, yeah, and, and Gould for Kindle is, is definitely a good option, a lot cheaper. It's, and it's, it's fine. If you have an actual physical Kindle, it's, it's quite usable. The Kindle app, or the Kindle web app, I don't find it very friendly for browsing big books like that. I mean, it's fine for reading a novel where you just are turning pages, but as a reference book where you're constantly needing to skip around and go back to the table of contents and go to the index, the uh, Kindle online Kindle reader is, is a little awkward for that. But the physical Kindles work a lot better. Um, so, um, 
All right. So did I miss any specific questions? So John, I see, is recommending the Solid Foundation and Harmony before Practical Counterpoint. And yeah, I see where you're coming from. In principle, you don't need that. In principle, if you know your triads, you can learn everything else you need about Harmony in, in, the, in, the, in the process of taking Practical Counterpoint because it's not really about functional harmony, really. And yet it kind of is. I would say you want to know secondary dominance. So if you're familiar with the idea of a secondary dominant, you know what you need for, um, you know everything you would need to be able to succeed in fact, counterpoint. If you're not familiar with the idea of a secondary dominant, you want to go through the harmony course, which is like the first two sections. And then all the more things you won't really need in working on the counterpoint course. And Ariana, yes, I did write, I've written a few pieces for orchestra, you know, that I keep using as a demo. So I wrote a short piece that I wrote uh, uh, when I was actually taking the orchestration course when I was working on master's degree. You know, I uh, wrote a short piece for orchestra for that. And that one I've never even tried to put in the new score. I don't even know if I still have the finale file for it. Probably I do somewhere. I should try it sometime. Um, and I've written a couple other things. You know, I arranged a little four-part hymn for orchestra, and I've done a couple of other short little excerpts for orchestra. Um, but yeah, it's not a ton of orchestral experience, I would say, that I have. So um, yeah, and the Kindle book is cheaper, and even a Kindle, <laughs> even the Kindle book plus a Kindle <laughs> might be cheaper than the physical book, depending on which Kindle you buy, um, perhaps. But uh, the Kindle can be useful for other reasons, too. So um, well, I'm glad that this conversation is working OK, you know, even though, you know, obviously I would I'd rather be doing all the screen share stuff. But this, this conversation is working great. So so whatever. Um, it's kind of an extension of what we did last week where I didn't use I deliberately didn't do any screen share and we just did ear training stuff. So. Um, any other questions here? Other things that I could talk about? And that, Dave, that's a really good observation about trying arranging before composing. Um, I agree with you, at least for my own, for someone like me. Um, I, I, I don't want to like pigeonhole how everyone should work. I will say that's probably the right answer for me. It's probably the right answer for a lot of people to think about arranging, taking a piece where the composition is there. You already have a melody, you already have the harmony, you already have some idea of how the accompaniment might go rhythmically, and now you're orchestrating it, you're arranging it. Um, but, because uh, yeah, you can learn a lot of skills there without having to deal with writing your own melodies. But on the other hand, writing your own melodies is like a skill too, and a lot of people do that and never really get into arranging, and you know, that's, that's certainly possible, and it's not less valid. But if you want to eventually do both, yeah, I would start with the arranging. Probably I don't know. that's my uh, that's my um, my recommendation. So Katrina, yeah, I will recommend my harmony course for sure. Then to uh, to get good with developing chord progressions, I go in the harmony course. I take I mostly use like folk songs, you know, Danny Boy and things like that, and go through the process of harmonizing them, you know, using really basic harmonizations, all diatonic chords, no accidentals, and then show how to take these same songs and harmonize them with a little bit of chromaticism, like secondary dominance. And then I show, well, now here's how we're going to use diminished chords, and here's how we're going to use augmented sixth chords and tritone substitutions and Neapolitans, and here's how, uh, you know, um, modulations work, and here's how you're going to build chord progressions that that fit various different common idioms like cadences and so forth. So there's a lot of things like uh, like that that you will learn in the harmony course that will help you create good harmonies to fit a melody. So um, uh, Ariana, you're asking about new sounds and uh, the fact that even when there's no slurs, it generally is legato. And see, unfortunately, new, new sounds like most synthesizers tries to shoot in the middle. It's like it wants uh, non-slurred notes to not sound stupid, like ta 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 tongue everything, but it doesn't want uh, it doesn't want the 
the uh, articulation to be completely missing either. So it tries to shoot somewhere in the middle so, so that things don't sound ridiculous because it doesn't differentiate currently. It doesn't have a way to play differently whether you're tonguing or slurring. Now it should, and probably the samples are there. It's just not hooked up yet. So I would expect in some coming update that new sounds will do a better job of indicating the difference between tongued and slurred notes. And really it's winds where it's the most different. Strings to a lesser extent, is there a difference? Piano, there's essentially no difference. Slur slurs are just there for window decoration. Um, but on wind there's a huge difference that new sound if it tongued everything but everything okay. most things sound okay there's some things that are a little, but some things a little mushy is better than everything sounding terrible but eventually it'll just get it right um, so uh yeah, and, and I'm sure no performer does that, and you, you sound will at some point as well, I'm, I'm quite sure. Um, so, uh, using chord numbers, lyrics, yeah, that's, yeah, using, um, when, we, when we sing, I'm feeling about German names, I am just gonna just, just tell you how these go, um, just to have something to say here. Um, so A, B, C, D, E, F, we're not going to, G, we're not going to use H instead of B. I mean, if you're in Germany, you might, but when I say using German names, I, I would say German-inspired naming um, as opposed to actual German names. I'm going to just move to a different table here because now there's a little more space and I'll have a little less um, sense that I'm bothering the guy next to me. Um, but um, uh, So sharks is the syllable is. So it's spelled below. So, um, C sharp is cease, D sharp is dees, E sharp is ease, F sharp is peace, G sharp is geese, A sharp is ace. And I don't know if Germans would actually pronounce it that way, but in our adaptation of the German system to make it useful in your training so that you can sing a single syllable uh, thing, that's how we do it. So, C, cease, D, dees. E and then F, E, G, G, A, A, B, and C. The flats are S, E, S, the letter E, S. Um, so, and it's pronounced S. So, coming down from C and then B, B flat is Bs, and then A, A flat is Os, and then G, and then G flat is Jess, and then F, and then E, E flat is F, and then B. D flat is death, and then uh, C. So those are um, things. Uh, Ariana, I have no insight into no performer. Never heard it before in my life. I never actually played with that and used it, so I really can't answer this. Um, so, um, you know, those that I've done decent, I think generally they found it to be the Piece of my own. So I'll sing that bad new sounds of the performer and get the one versus another. But they don't sound good. They sound almost as sounding, is what I would say about no performer. And it only costs a couple hundred dollars more than new sounds. So, yeah. <laughs> um, obviously, I'm being a little facetious. No performer has some advantages. It has more instruments. It's got some features that new sounds doesn't currently have, but uh, overall, you know, I'm not, not feeling the need. Okay. Um, I think, I don't even know what time it, oh, wait a minute, oh, crap. Did I just close the thing? Ah. Did I close this? I'm going to keep talking. Am I still here? Good. I am still here. Okay. Um, so, um, Anyhow, I was trying to look at what time it is, but now I realize I have a watch. 11.15, yeah. So I'm going to um, start uh, wrapping things up here. Yeah, it wasn't actually that the internet was glitchy. It's that I closed, I accidentally closed the, uh, closed the app while I was trying to look at my watch. Um, and that was silly. So anyhow, I'm back. What I'm saying here is um, that uh, I, um, 
I should probably be heading off to my gate and taking care of some flight details and so forth. Um, so I'm going to be doing that. And thanks for the questions here. For the chat. This is kind of fun, a little bit. Different. And um, uh, yeah, I will be back in plenty of time to be on my normal schedule next week, office hours Tuesday for gold members, and then Wednesday, masterclass, Thursday, uh, I mean, Wednesday, Friday, Thursday, masterclass. So I'll, I'll be back with all my usual this week. So um, hope you all had a good time today as well. And um, yeah, uh, I do want to do a project. So also speaking of the gold level membership, you may remember that that is a kind of ticket into the musicianship skills workshop normally, the project. So I do have some ideas for projects and videos that I want to make and stuff. That'll be part of that. And I'll share more about that next week. So, all right. I'm going to get going and uh, see you all as soon as I figure out how to hang up here.